happy families are alike. That's how Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina begins. All happy families are alike, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. A Google search shows this. I asked Google two very simple questions. What are the most dysfunctional families in literature? And what are the most dysfunctional movie families? And there are a few novels in literature that recur. Shakespeare's Hamlet and King Lear, those families. The, the family in the Brothers Komarazov by Dostoevsky. But beyond that, the diversity of answers that Google gives is amazing. One author listed 20 books, none of which I'd ever heard of, that show dysfunctional families. The Nest by Cynthia Dupree, Mostly Dead Things by Kristen Arnott, My Name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Stein. Have you ever heard of any of these? The Liars Club by Mary Kerr, This Is Where I Leave You by Jonathan Tropper. I don't think I like to read discouraging books because I've never read any of these. There's one called Running With Scissors, which sounds bad enough, by Augustine Burroughs, and it goes on. Dysfunctional families are a per popular topic, partially, I'm sure, because authors are always told to write what they know. And most of us come from somewhat dysfunctional families, especially authors, apparently. It's even worse in the movies. The one smidgen of agreement among all the lists was on a movie called The Royal Tenenbaums, which I'll admit I never heard of, but it's got to be a bad family. I've heard of some of them, of course. There are the Godfather's mo movies, which even I know depict a uniquely dysfunctional family. There is Game of Thrones, which I've never watched, but which features incredible violence and betrayal in the Lannister family. And then, again, there were tons of movies I'd never heard of. Nebraska, The Birdcage, The Ice Storm, the skeleton twins. I mean, in my own naive lack of exposure, the ones I thought of was October Sky, where Homer and his dad have a strained relationship. That kind of gets resolved as the movie goes on. And The Ultimate Gift, where Jason's grandfather, Red Stevens, has broken relationships with all his kids, but he wants to do better even after his death with this one grandson, Jason. But I mention all these books and movies because they witness to one simple truth. We live in a broken world. We could look at brokenness between nations. We could look at brokenness in the economies. We could look at crime. We could look at disease and disaster. All those things would lead us to the same conclusion. We live in a broken world. But perhaps the clearest, closest, and saddest Evidence of our brokenness is seen in the conflict and often failure of our treatment to those closest to us, our families. I don't have to go to secular literature. I don't have to go to the big screen to show this. I only need to go to the later life of David as the consequences of his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah are played out to see a family that epitomizes the brokenness of the world. Scripture pulls no punches in depicting this, as we'll see in 2 Samuel chapters 13 to 18. The chaos of David's later reign shows us that we fail. We grieve in a broken world, but to rescue. We're not going to be able to explore every detail of this long story. It is a long story, but I encourage you to read it. Sad as it is, it's also an extremely well-told story. So in chapters 13 and 14, we'll see how brokenness is expressed and amplified by absence. In chapters 15 and 16, we'll see how brokenness leads to rebellion and contempt. In chapters 17 and 18, we'll see how brokenness leads to grief. But we're going to end in Psalm 31, a Psalm of David, which reminds us that brokenness can lead us back to God. In chapter 12, where we were last week, God used Nathan to pronounce the consequences of David's sin with Bathsheba and against Uriah. God had said, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, 
because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. of David's life saw the outworking of these consequences. It's not that there weren't times of peace and joy and victory and trust, but those times were punctuated over and over in the life of this family by brokenness and strife, by war and bloodshed. Second Samuel 13, 1. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. We met the actors in this tragedy in 2 Samuel chapter 3. Sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel. His second, Chiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And the third, Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. Not mentioned in that list, is a daughter that was also born to David and Maaka, and her name was Tamar. So Amnon, David's firstborn, has conceived an illicit lust for Tamar, not completely unlike David's illicit lust for Bathsheba. And I call it lust, well, the text calls it love, because it has all the characteristics of lust and none of the characteristics of love, which always seeks the best for the one who is loved. Amnon is only concerned to fulfill his own sinful desires. He has no care for Tamar at all. This is because Amnon is a broken, sinful person, just as we all are, just as David was when he took Bathsheba and killed Uriah. The brokenness of the world is at heart the brokenness of individuals. And as in the case of Adam, the sinfulness of an individual can lead to much larger consequence, as we're seeing in this text. So here's Amnon. Unable to carry out his desires, he confides in his cousin Jonadab, who was a very crafty man. Jonadab gave him a plan. Amnon was to pretend he was sick in bed, and he asked his father, David, to tell Tamar to make him some cakes, bread, some kind of pastry. David sent her, and she cooked for him. But when it was ready, Amnon sent everyone else away and told her to bring it to his bedchamber. And there, he overpowered her and violated her. She tried to raise it with him. But her words and cries did not penetrate his lust, and she wasn't strong enough physically to stop him. Again, we know this is lust, because immediately afterwards, the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. He didn't love her at all. He hates her now. He sends her away, even though in that culture it would have been okay for him to marry his half-sister as she had as she had desired as she had said, but he sends her away. She's shamed, she's desolate, she's crushed. This is where Absalom, Amnon's younger brother, comes into the picture, 2 Samuel 12 20. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother bid with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. This is as dysfunctional as family gets. Tamar is desolate. King David is very angry. But as far as we can tell, that's all he does is get angry. There's no indication that he talks to Amnon, 
no indication that he tries to help Tamar. Tamar. The truth is that in family matters and in some other matters, David, it seems, was at times a conflict avoider, which is painful to me because I'm the same way. I have to force myself to get involved in anything that looks like conflict. But I'm wrong in that at times. David is wrong in this at this time. I mean, he's got the courage to stand up in God's name to a giant, but only rarely do we see him rebuking anyone close to him, even when they really need it. Instead, in this instance, he shuts down. He withdraws. Or is that me? I do. I do that sometimes. And maybe you do too. Sometimes. And David does. Sometimes. Absalom even looks like he's doing the same thing. He hates Amnon for what he's done, but he doesn't say anything to him either good or bad. But in Absalom's case, what he's doing is nursing his hatred. His anger grows against Amnon, but also apparently against his father, David. And after two years, verse 23, he can't stand it any longer. He throws a party. He invites the king's sons. David doesn't come, ostensibly because he doesn't want to be a burden. Or maybe he was still avoiding conflict. But at the party, Absalom, quite plainly, has his servants kill his brother Amnon. The first report David gets says that Absalom has killed all his other sons, but that's not true. Nonetheless, David mourns for Amnon, and Absalom, convinced that David will have him killed, flees the scene, 2 Samuel 13, 37. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Gasher, and David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Gashur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. David loves his family. He mourns for Amnon. He mourns for the absence of Absalom, who he loves. But he had failed to confront Amnon. He had left Tamar in bitterness. And if he'd done that, maybe Absalom's anger would have been abated. So he mourns. But he doesn't pursue. He doesn't confront Absalom. He longs to go to him. He wants relationship with his son. But he doesn't do it. Sometimes... This is called the sin of absence. And it's a cause of dysfunction in many families. In its most extreme form, it is when one parent or another pulls themselves entirely out of a child's life. This might be because of the child's sin. More often, it might be because of the parent's sin, from addiction to simple self-centeredness. I couldn't stay because I had to deal with my own stuff. But our kids, our family... That is our own stuff. And you don't even have to physically leave to be absent. You can be absent through workaholism. You can be absent emotionally, physically there, but you never engage with your family. You can be absent because your presence or your addiction was abusive and and you had to leave for the safety of the family. So many, perhaps all of the books and movies that we talked about earlier feature dysfunctional families with an absent parent in one or more of these ways. And David, at this point, is behaving a bit like an absent father. Yeah, his kids were sinful, but his absence contributed to how bad things got. And in chapter 14, Joab, of all people, seems to be trying to make things better. He sees that David longs for Absalom, his son, whom he loves. So Joab sends a wise widow from Tekoa who tells David a story, as Nathan had done when he confronted David's sin. She claims her two sons fought, one killed the other, and now the killer will be put to death. 
that would leave her husband's estate without an heir and herself desolate. It's more just, she says, to leave my surviving son alive. And David agrees. But then she turns the story back on him. She says, in giving this decision, the king convicts himself. By refusing to be reconciled to Absalom, David has compounded his sorrow. David is not unsmart. He sees the hand of Joab in the story the widow is telling. So he summons Joab, and he says, okay, go and get Absalom. Yay. Absalom comes back to Jerusalem. But David still doesn't see him, doesn't reconcile with him. This makes things worse. Absalom is right there, and still his father won't see him. And two more years go by, and Absalom's seeing nobody. And finally, he's desperate. He actually burns one of Joab's fields to get Joab's attention. And then he sends Joab back to King David to say, why have I come from Gesher? It would be better for me to be there still. Now for, now therefore, let me go into the presence of the king. And if there was guilt in me, let him put me to death. And by the way, I mean, implicit in all this is the fact that Absalom actually at this point, to this point, was not truly guilty. He had taken things into his own hands, but he had done what the avenger of blood in the Old Testament is supposed to do. He had avenged against Amnon. And, and so David now relents, at least partially. Verse 33, then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So there is some reconciliation. Yay. The man has been five years. They've been estranged for five years. And so the gesture doesn't fully heal what's going on within Absalom. So the best way to deal with, draw, with withdrawal and absence is to resist the temptation to let it get started in the, in the first place. Lord, let me not pull back from this situation. The next best way is to work through the issues that separate you, and even if you can't agree on them, to place the priority on relationship, the relationship between me and my kids, the relationships in our lives can be continued even when there is conflict between us. When Gail and I were studying orphan care, one of the best teachings we received was don't punish children by sending them away, but, but have their time out or their other discipline bring them physically closer to you so that the attachment between you is maintained. I mean, that's not always possible, but it really is wise, and we've seen story after story of how this helps kids from broken families become attached in a orphan care situation. But the dysfunction in a family is never entirely one person's fault. It's never even entirely the fault of the father. Absalom here is making sinful and grievous choices. After five years, his already broken way of thinking has grown into outright rebellion. So after Absalom was settled in Jerusalem, he began to conspire against David. He began to spend time at the city gate, ingratiating himself to all who came to Jerusalem with issues or lawsuits. He said, oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. Whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And this is how it goes, whether it's in Hamlet, the Godfather, or even the ultimate gift. The brokenness of individuals cascades into larger consequences. Absalom 
broken by the fall, murderous because of the sin of his brother, and impacted by the absence of his father, has gotten to the point of simple, grievous rebellion. So after four years, and I think that's four more years, the time is right. He gets David's leave to go to Hebron and make an offering. But secretly, he's assembling all these people who have become his supporters so that they will declare him king and make war with David. When he gets there to Hebron, he sends for a fit. Oh, man, I could say this one. Ahithophel, all right, one of David's best advisors. Ahithophel joins the rebellion, possibly because he's the grandfather of Bathsheba, whose marriage David ruined. So rapidly now does this revolt grow that as soon as David hears of it, he gathers those loyal to him and flees Jerusalem. In addition to his household servants, this included three bands of mercenaries, the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and the Gittites. Why these foreign mercenaries were more faithful to David than his own people is a mystery. Ittai, the Gittite in particular, pledged absolute loyalty of himself and his people to David. The leading priests, Abiathar and Zadok, also wanted to come with David, bringing the Ark of the Covenant. But David sent them back to the city, trusting, trusting, that God would bring him back to worship there again. And David also recruited them to spy on Absalom. Each of these priests happened to have a son, and the sons were recruited to bring information out to David. And yet David was not cold or calculating in all this. When he went out of the city, he wept, and all those with him wept. When he heard that Ahithophel had joined the other side, he grieved. Psalm 3 says, a Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. O oh Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for God, for him. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. So David laments this uprising against him, but he continues to trust in God. And, and honestly, throughout this episode, David shows tremendous humility and trust in God and, and a seeming awareness that he needs to trust in God as these consequences work out in his family's life. David's other counselor, Hushai the archite, was faithful to David, even though Ahithophel wasn't. He tried to join David. In fact, Scripture calls Hushai David's friend. But the king sent him back to Jerusalem, to Absalom, to foil the counsel of Ahithophel and told him to communicate through the priests and through their sons. So now David's outside the city. In chapter 16, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, shows up with food supplies and stuff for David and his group, and he proclaims his loyalty to David. When David asks about Mephibosheth, you remember Mephibosheth, the one who was crippled in both feet, Ziba claims that he stayed in Jerusalem to try to get his father Saul's kingdom back. We'll hear more about that. The next person to show up, verse 5, is also from the house of Saul, Shimei. But he comes out to curse David, saying that all this has happened because David is a man of blood, blaming David for the death and downfall of Saul. And Abishai, Joab's brother, wants to kill Shimei. But David restrains him, saying, No, this is just the day I've received curses. Maybe the Lord will one day give me blessings instead. David continues to trust God with humility, even at this moment. And so Absalom takes Jerusalem without a fight. Then he consults with Ahithophel and Hushai, the two chief counselors of David. Ahithophel says that he should take 12,000 picked men, pursue David, and catch him while he's still disorganized. But David's guy on the inside, Hushai, says, you know, Ahithophel's usually right. 
But in this case, his counsel is not good. David's crafty, he says. He's not going to get caught. What you ought to do is gather your full strength and go after him in force. And Absalom preferred Hushai's plan, which was probably a result of David praying that the counsel of Ahithophel would be not listened to, frustrated. And this Absalom listening to Hushai, in fact, probably saved David's life. All right, so you can see, I mean, I'm not giving you all the details, but this is a tremendously well-told story. It's got everything, spies and traitors and all this stuff. And yet, you know, when we read stories of the brokenness of the world, yeah, we somehow find that brokenness fascinating. The two sons of the priests do their job. They give David the news. He goes on uh, across the Jordan and establishes himself on the far side. He gets help from several loyal locals over there. And at this point, the momentum of the whole thing has begun to swing to David. Chapter 18 is the climax. David knows where Absalom and his army are at this point, and he divides his own army into three groups, one-third under Joab, one-third under Joab's brother Abishai, and one-third under Ittai the Gittite. As they leave for the battle, David tells all three that he wants Absalom treated gently, despite his rebellion. David still loves Absalom, and he does not want to harm him. And, and I'm guessing at this point that David wants genuine reconciliation, even after this rebellion. David's armies go out, they encounter the Israelites, there's a battle in the forest of Ephraim, and David's armies win. Though the text tells us that this rough wilderness forest took as many lives as the soldiers did in this battle. And in the chaos, Absalom is separated from his army, and he, and he meets Joab's soldiers, 2 Samuel 18, 9. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. Graphic picture. This is why it's said that the forest killed as many as the soldiers. But someone from Joab's group who sees this runs off and tells Joab, and Joab, who you remember many weeks ago I called Joab the Ruthless, he says, well, why didn't you kill him? And the soldier says, you heard David say to treat him gently. And Joab literally says, I don't have time for this. And he takes three javelins and kills Absalom while he's still hanging in the tray. The brokenness of the world, sinfulness of fallen people, leads to rebellion, leads to bloodshed. This family has now lost its firstborn son and its thirdborn son, Amnon and Absalom. We know nothing about the second born, Abigail's son, Chiliab. He's never mentioned again. In a later chapter, the fourth son, Adonijah, decides to try Absalom's trick and set himself up as king, and that doesn't go well either. And nobody's happy about all this, especially David. Brokenness and a broken world does not leave anybody satisfied. It only leads to grief. We know this from movies. We know this from literature. We know this in our personal experiences, if not in our own families, but certainly in the families of people around us. Living in a fallen world is hard, sad, and the sinful choices of those around us and our own sinful choices lead to grief. After the death of Absalom, Joab knows that his king is going to grieve. When Ahimaaz, I can't say that, Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, the priest, volunteers to be the runner who carries the news to David. Joab says, no, no, you don't, you don't want to carry this news. 
job knows that David has a habit of killing the bearers of bad news. So instead of Ahimaaz, he sends a Cushite, a foreigner, who in Joab's eyes may have been more expendable. But Ahimaaz insists on going too, and he's a faster runner than the Cushite. The watchmen see him from the gate of the city where David has made his temporary headquarters, and they say, that guy runs a lot like Ahimaaz, and he brings word about the victory of David's army. But he has the good sense, for whatever reason, not to share the news of Absalom's death. And then the Cushite arrives a few minutes later. He's not so discreet, but he's euphemistic. He tells David, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. In other words, Absalom is dead. Surprisingly, nothing bad seems to happen to the Cushite. But David grieves. Verse 33, and the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is some of the purest and most heartfelt grief in the entire Bible. And it speaks especially to those of us who have sons, I think, or children. These phrases have become a metaphor for grief itself, especially the grief of a parent. William Faulkner wrote a novel called Absalom, Absalom, which revolves around a man's search for a son and an heir thwarted, time and again, by his tragic brokenness and sinfulness. In the World War II novel, War and Remembrance by Herman Woke, the main character's beloved son is killed in one of the small mop-up actions after the great victory at Midway. Woke writes, On that fearful first morning, when Warren had not returned, a Bible verse had kept running through his Pug Henry's mind, a verse over which he had once broken down, reading the Bible with his family long ago. Each morning, a member of the family had taken a chapter, and the last battle of David and Absalom had fallen to him. Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Victor Henry had choked over the verse slammed the book shut, and hurried from the room. That morning, while waiting for Warren to return, his agonized father feeling had welled up, and those words had repeated and repeated in his brain like a torturing old song. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee, oh, Absalom, my son. My son. This is the heart of David. This is the heart of God. Who a thousand years later sacrificed his son to die in our place. So we live in a broken world. We ourselves are broken and sinful people. Ultimately, that brokenness leads to grief. Death itself is an enemy. And until Jesus returns, the grief of death continues. Though we know that we don't have to mourn like those who have no hope, but we do have to face the facts of sin and death. All this turmoil, this sin, this violence, all these broken relationships, this agony over choices made, and choices made for us, is not the way it's supposed to be. The only explanation for our grief in the world we live in is that we were, in C.S. Lewis's famous words, made for another world. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And praise God that David knew this. I want to end today with a few verses from Psalm 31, another psalm of David. 
The heading of this psalm does not specify the circumstance, but it fits well, this, this account that we've just read. So starting at verse 11, David says, Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors. You remember the guy throwing the things at him and an object of dread to my acquaintances, those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. That's a pretty good description of David fleeing Jerusalem. But he says, verse 14, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Like David, when the brokenness of the world gangs up on us, we have the awesome privilege of turning to God in faith for rescue. What does David say? I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times, all of this is in your hands. I'm trusting you with that. But rescue me, O God, from the hand of my enemies. I'm trusting you for that. Make your face shine on your servant. I'm trusting in your presence, no matter how awful my circumstances or even my own brokenness may be. Because I can say, David can say, save me in your steadfast love. David knew the chesed, the steadfast love of God. And we too, we fail, we grieve in a fallen world, but we can trust God to rescue. I was thinking about this during men's prayer meeting earlier this week. We actually have a tremendous advantage over David Because we can open our Bibles every day, anytime, and we can see our rescue in Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Jesus is the answer to this lost and broken world. Jesus is the answer to our own tendencies and temptations towards sin and brokenness. In those moments, when I am most absent and withdrawn from where I need to engage, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is my hope. In my moments of rebellion, Jesus is my hope. In those moments of grief, Jesus is my hope. He rescues and saves. He rescues in steadfast love and saves through his infinite mercy.